recording start because a lot will come in just at this point here. And so this is, even before I pray, I should have started the recording and said, welcome to uh, Revelation here on Monday night uh, at this particular location, but from all over the place as well. And I really look forward to the study together. So let's pray as we get ready to start. Father, as we get ready to delve into your word, we just want to begin with thanksgiving. We are just always so grateful to you for how good you are. Uh, we reflect on what you have done for us through Jesus, and we just say thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We can try to give our lives as living sacrifices to say, in light of what you've done for us, Father, this is the least that we can do for you, but we don't even feel that's adequate. Thank you for the redemption that we have through Christ, forgiveness of sin, pure conscience, eternal life beginning here and now, for hope that we have in the midst of difficulties now and a hope that reaches into eternity. Thank you for your Holy Spirit living in us. Thank you for your written word pointing us to the living word, Jesus. Thank you for your church that we get to participate in and be a part of. And just receive our gratitude, Father. We want to have a practice of gratitude. And as we study, we invite you to be here with us. We dare not undertake study of your word on our own. We need your spirit to, to guide us, to give us insight and understanding, to help us to know you better, Father. So be present with us, not only in this particular room, uh, but in every place that people are. Uh, from all over the state and elsewhere. I pray that our hearts are warmed and encouraged as we study together, that we're strengthened and deepened in our faith, that Jesus is lifted up uh, before our eyes. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. All right. Let me turn this one to the one off. So, uh, again, uh, as we get ready to, to start, I'm going to turn this light off for a bit. It'll cast a shadow, I know, uh, on me, but uh, for the folks here, they'll be able to see uh, the screen over there. But, uh, you get it right here on your phone or tablet or computer, but they're getting it projected. So, uh, kind of as a beginning for Revelation, uh, I think it's common for all of us to have uh, a keen interest in studying Revelation. And I want to just go ahead and just be up front here at the beginning and in, the, in this spirit to say, well, what this course is not. And so it's not a study of Revelation as a secret predictive code uh, to figure out future events. Uh, I doubt anybody has come to it for that reason only. You're sure we can be wondering about the way that things unfold in our world today, but it is not that uh, to, to try to sleuth out uh, everything that's happening in our time today. But to go on and say what it is, it is a study based on the belief that the Jesus of the Gospels is the Jesus of Revelation. And right off the bat, that may not say much to you. You may not, you may wonder, you know, well, so where, where is that coming from? But if we think about it, and if we, depending on maybe what interpretations we've heard about Revelation, uh, it can be a very different Jesus that we see in Revelation than Jesus of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus in the Gospels. Uh, but, and this is drawing from, you know, many good teachers, uh, kind of a, a, wide, a wide base of, of teachers that help inform this perspective, certainly, certainly by no means, uh, you know, unique uh, to me, I've picked up on this from a number of other good teachers. Uh, this is gonna be the same Jesus that we encounter. It's a continuation of the nonviolent Jesus overcoming the Roman Empire, overcoming as a slaughtered lamb, not as a bloodletting king. Uh, 
as I go through slides, it reminds me to mention for all the new uh, students, if you're taking this for something for the first time, uh, you can take notes on these. Now, these are not in the handouts that I've given you some of these. There will all, as we go through, there will always be stuff that I'm offering that's not in those notes. But the PowerPoint is already up on Dropbox, uh, the Dropbox link that I sent in the email. Uh, PowerPoint is, is in that. And so all of these are, are there in, in that. But the nonviolent Jesus, that's the Jesus that we were referring to of the Gospels, the Jesus of the Sermon on the Mount, overcomes the empire, but not by sword. And we catch that, of course, right off what, what happened in the garden. Here, here they've come to get him, his own followers, you know, pull out the sword. Peter, the first among you, pull out the sword, cut off the ear of Malchus. And Jesus, what's his response? Yeah. And put it away. Yeah. This is, you know, this is not the way of my kingdom. And, uh, and so Jesus gives us that very clearly. So he overcomes even an empire, but as a slaughtered lamb, uh, not as a blood-letting king. And this is a study based on a premise that Jesus' gospel of peace and suffering provides the framework for understanding revelation. That it is his, the good news that Jesus delivered of peace, of reconciliation, yes, I know. Well, there are the, the passages like Matthew 10, or when he's sending them out, uh, you know, talking about the opposition that they will encounter. I've come to bring a sword. But of course, as you delve into those more deeply in the Gospels, you know immediately uh, that he is not talking about a physical sword or violence, uh, because he continues throughout his ministry to mix uh, violence in the bud mm -hmm. and does not want any of his followers to followers to follow the way of violence. Uh, Brian Zahn, Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God, says that this way, the book of Revelation is not where the good news of the gospel goes to die. And again, depending on how much you've studied Revelation uh, or some of the interpretations that you heard that are, uh, there's mega violence uh, with some of those interpretations. Uh, this this is kind of speaking to that. Uh, it is not what we what we see in the Gospels. There is a continuity uh, on into the Book of Revelation itself. Uh, because if we if we don't study it well or uh, very thoughtfully, it can seem like wow, they're two very different uh, lenses here on the Kingdom of God. Two different lenses on Jesus, but Jesus is not schizophrenic. He doesn't have a, a split personality, just as sometimes we can hear of, uh, of God, you know, well, God of wrath in the Old Testament, God of love in the New Testament. No, no. You know, we, we don't have, again, a, a God that has a split personality or that has changed or morphed through the centuries. There is a continuity. Uh, the God of love there in the Old Testament. So <clears throat> I hope, you know, to some degree that even those brief reflections will begin to just prep us for what we're going to get into. And in our study tonight, I attached two handouts uh, in the email, and those of you here have hard copies, two handouts. The first uh, handout for the introduction, uh, there's no study questions for it. Uh, and it doesn't get into chapter one. And we're not going to go through here tonight. We're not working through lesson number one on all of the introduction. That's the reason that you, you have that there in note form and you can read through the background material. And uh, I want us to be able, after a little bit here, to be able to use our time uh, getting into Revelation itself. And we'll go on into uh, unit two and go into Revelation one. Because the, the whole study is longer than most of them, it's 17 units long. Well, we're only going to be in class together 14 weeks, so we've got to compress a little. So we do, we start that tonight. 
And I do, let me go ahead and add and say again, for those of you online, uh, please do feel free, really want you to know, classroom and online, uh, that uh, you are free uh, to interject, you know, unmute and share thoughts or question. Um, uh, we'll try to ask some as we, as we go through the material, but I want us all to, to reflect on this together. Uh, not gonna do any more right there uh, in, in the PowerPoint. Uh, a number of you know that have uh, taken classes uh, with me that we use Bible project videos and some of you even that haven't, you may be familiar with the bibleproject.com and their videos on scripture. Uh, do some excellent work and help provide some uh, perspective on scripture on all the books of the Bible as well as some of the themes and later on we'll look at the one on the ap apocalyptic literature. Uh, and so uh, after looking at a few more introductory notes again that are will be up online uh, on Dropbox so that you don't have to worry about jotting them all down. Then we're going to just watch at least the first part of uh, the video. But a few other thoughts uh, in this document up there is uh, the things that we just covered: uh, information or thoughts on the revelation from the Bible Project that we're going to get into. But another. Uh, teacher that I use is Ron Hermes. So he makes a point in getting ready to go through Revelation. He says, the lived experience for original hearers and readers uh, comes to bear on this. This document makes sense to its original audience because some interpretation would almost sound as radical as to say, nobody who read that in the first century could have understood. It's only us at this point in time, maybe even only us in Western culture, or maybe even a little more ethnocentric than that, maybe only us in America today could really understand what uh, was being written in the book of Revelation. And not just Ron, but other good teachers will say, no, it made sense to the people who heard it and its, it, its original audience. Uh, it dealt with issues that they were facing. And there's a lot of cultural uh, illusions that it's easy for us uh, to miss, miss out on. So the real lives of real believers in Asia Minor, and that's what session three is all about, are firmly imbued by the author. Revelation as a quote, Christian text, it promotes the gracious salvation of God's peaceable kingdom. And those are some of the thoughts that we were sharing earlier, just phrased differently. Uh, whatever else we might be tempted to do with Revelation, we must ask the question, is its message compatible with Jesus's announcement of good news? Does what we read in the Revelation jive with? Uh, is, can it be reconciled with Jesus's proclamation of good news as we hear in the Gospels? Is the Jesus of the Gospels recognizable in Revelation? We kind of covered that earlier. And of the literary style or shape of it, as uh, uh, you know, not just some poetry, but uh, apocalyptic literature. Before we can answer what does it say or what does it mean, questions, we must be able to deal with what is it? What is this thing? What type of literature is it? And that's where I said later, even using uh, the Bible Project's video on uh, apocalyptic literature uh, will, will be helpful. And so he deals with that in his seminar. Uh, in session one. So just giving you a few other thoughts and perspective there on it. Now, give me just a second to get to uh, Revelation. I'm just gonna do part of part one. And I gotta make sure y'all should hear, you can let me know somebody online, video or someone else can let me know if, you, if uh, video messes up at all or if you can't hear well. And I think y'all will have what we need. The book of the Revelation of Jesus. 
The author of this book, which is not called Revelations, by the way, is named at the beginning. It was written by John, which could refer to the beloved disciple who wrote the Gospel and the letters of John, or it could be a different John, a Messianic Jewish prophet who traveled about and taught in the early church. Whichever John it was, he makes clear in the opening paragraph what kind of book he has written. He calls it, first of all, a revelation or apocalypse. The Greek word is apokalupsis, and it refers to a type of literature very familiar to John's readers from the Hebrew scriptures and from other popular Jewish texts. Apocalypse has recounted a prophet's symbolic dreams and visions that revealed God's heavenly perspective on history and current events so that the present could be viewed in light of history's final outcome. And John says this apocalypse is a prophecy, which means it's a word from God spoken through a prophet to God's people, usually to warn or comfort them in a time of crisis. By calling this book a prophecy, John's saying that it stands in the tradition of the biblical prophets and is bringing their message to a climax. And this apocalyptic prophecy was sent to real people that John knew. The book opens and closes as a circular letter that was sent to seven churches in the ancient Roman province of Asia. Now, seven is a meaningful number for John. It's a symbol of completeness based on the seven-day Sabbath cycle in the Old Testament. And John has woven sevens into every single part of this book. Now, with this opening, John has given us clear guidance about how he wants us to understand this book. Jewish apocalypse is communicated through symbolic imagery and numbers. It is not a secret predictive code about the timing of the end of the world. Rather, John is constantly using these symbols that are drawn from the Old Testament, and he expects his readers to go discover what the symbols mean by looking up the text he's alluding to. Also, the fact that it's a letter means that John is actually addressing the situation of these first century churches. And so while this book has much to say to Christians of later generations, the book's meaning must first be anchored in the historical context of John's time, and place, and audience. Which brings us into the book's first section, Jesus' message to the seven churches. John was exiled on the island of Patmos, and he saw a vision of the risen Jesus, exalted as king of the world. And he was standing among seven burning lights. And John's told this is a symbol of the seven churches in Asia Minor that's been adapted from the book of the prophet Zechariah. And Jesus starts addressing the specific problems that face each church. Some were apathetic due to wealth and affluence. Others were morally compromised. Their people were still eating ritual meals and sleeping around in pagan temples. But others among the churches remained faithful to Jesus, and they were suffering harassment and even violent persecution. And Jesus warns that things are going to get worse. A tribulation is upon the churches that will force them to choose between compromise or faithfulness. By John's day, the murder of Christians by the Roman Emperor Nero was passed, and the persecution of Christians by Emperor Domitian was likely underway. And so the temptation was to deny Jesus, either to avoid persecution or simply to join the spirit of the Roman age. And Jesus calls them to faithfulness so that they can overcome or literally conquer. And Jesus promises a reward for everyone in these churches who does conquer. Each reward is drawn directly from the book's final vision about the marriage of heaven and earth. And so this opening section, it sets up the main plot tension that will drive the storyline in this book. Will Jesus' people endure? Will they inherit the new world that God has in store? And why is faithfulness to Jesus described as conquering? The rest of the book is John's answer. After All right, we're going to pause on the video there, no reason there. We've already uh, gone into chapter two and three there, so no reason to go further right now. Uh, and of course, you have ac you can have access to those anytime you go. Uh, the link is even on the back of the syllabus, bibleproject.com. Uh, uh, always recommend them. a great group of people, a nonprofit up in the Northwest. Uh, they do, do great work. Uh, before we go in uh, to the text, uh, his, his uh, wording there rem oops, reminded me of one other thing that I wanted to sh share here uh, from the reflections, because he went to the end talking about the marriage of heaven and uh, new heavens, and new earth. And uh, right from one of the sources that I've used, Bruce Green's The Thrill of Hope on Revelation. He, he says, what have we seen in the book? And this is really more at the end, but I'm using it to whet our appetites for what we're going to see. Really, what haven't we seen? What an ending, what a book. 
We've seen seven churches of Asia standing toe to toe with the mighty Roman Empire is driven by the forces of Satan. When the smoke and ashes have cleared, the seven churches remained and Rome had gone down to defeat. Rome's Lord was no match for the church's Lord. And again, not by violence, not ever by sword. We've seen the triumphant church pictured as a new heaven and earth, a glorious city, a beautiful bride in Eden. We've heard the angel, the apostle, and Jesus testify to the truthfulness of all that is in the book. We've seen victory as great as any will ever see until we see him. And uh, that's, I appreciate some of uh, Bruce's reflection and commentary throughout, uh, just uh, keeping a perspective on the overall, the big picture of, of Revelation in that way and helping us to remember uh, what it is that, uh, that he's done with the message that he's coming across. I'm gonna go back up and just leave it on that whenever we're not using uh, something else. So there'll be uh, something on the screen for all of, the, all of those of you online. So I want us to be able to uh, here, go through chapter one now. And often when we're classroom only, of course, we'll have, sometimes we'll have various ones to read, but that won't work as well now with so many online because they wouldn't be able to hear you well. So I want to just go ahead and play it. I use, uh, use the NIV, the uh, dramatized audio Bible. And so uh, ready here. Go to Revelation 1. It should be queued. Revelation chapter 1. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of his prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us, and has freed us from our sin by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. Is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion, in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands 
on the seven churches. Sure. All right. And we'll stop there and just work through uh, chapter one. Uh, I like to often stop after we listen to scripture and just ask the question, and I know it's a little easier for folks to respond here in the classroom than it is for you online, but still, you know, even online, uh, even if you just reflect on it, uh, is there anything that stood out to you as we just heard the scripture read like that, maybe that you hadn't seen before, that you hadn't noticed? And it's okay that there's there's not. Okay. What about the first one with B? And he didn't care of them. That's not my secret. All right. So, Trambrain, if I'm hearing you right, the, what he says here about. I was he up. He, he was dead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jesus. And so we'll, we'll, yeah, good question as we get to that. Uh -huh. uh, that is the appearance of Jesus there. Uh, okay. Was dead, was crucified now. Now resurrected. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Earth. Yes. Are you saying yes to me? Yes. The, the, in verse five, what really pointed out to me in a bigger way that the firstborn from the dead, that spoke volumes to me just now after reading revelations that one little scripture right there um was yeah. very popular yeah yeah good to have things like that you know we've read it before you know you've mark you've been over that before but still sometimes and we see it it just it, it stands out just like it did to you Trembrain, with what he says later there in 18 and both of those, of course, have the common denominator, firstborn from the dead, uh, was dead, but now now alive. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, that should always serve as an encouragement to us. It's not that Jesus was the first person ever raised from the dead. No, I mean, you can go back to some of the Old Testament stories. Uh, Jesus raised, you know, of course, Lazarus. He raised the widow of Nain's son. But they were raised back to normal, mortal life. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you know, Lazarus had to pass over again, mm -hmm. uh, you know, die again. But with Jesus, the firstborn, the first one uh, raised from the dead with the glorified body. It's always think when you think of talking about resurrection, what Paul says in Romans 1, 4, that He's the son of God. And he was declared with power to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. It is the resurrection, of course, that powerfully proclaims uh, Jesus is Lord. And, and all of that language used is so significant here in Revelation because the empire of Rome had its lords, the Caesars. And so he, in a sense, they... They use cryptic language, but it's seditious language. This is part of what got Paul beheaded in Philippians, where he constantly talked about Jesus as Lord. And he was using language that was attributed to even the Caesars. And uh, Rome only stomached it to, to a point, and they felt like it was a threat against their dominion. But we'll see that as we go on, go on through this. But one of the things I think that it would be helpful to us about uh, revelation and it's touched on in some of those introductory remarks, but it is about empires. And at the time it was the Roman empire that the believers in Asia minor were dealing with, but the truths are, are everlasting. They carry right through the principles, the truths about empires carry right through to us today. All of the empires that have arisen before Rome, after Rome, of course, if you go to Daniel, you know, there's some empires in the vision of the Stat, the statue in, in uh, Daniel chapter 2, you know, the Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks with Alexander the Great, the Romans, and after, the, after Rome, after its fall 3, 400 AD, then you have other empires. We have our empire today. And Revelation helps us to know how to live in the context of empires. And empires by nature 
and, you know, by definition, they are, they are not friendly to the kingdom. They are not friendly to Jesus as Lord over the hearts of people. So still true for us today. Uh, so yeah, Joseph. Uh, I don't know if it's a translation thing or, or not, but in verse uh, four, uh, we have, it says the seven spirits. A footnote says it all, or it could be the seven bold spirits. And, uh, and then, as the one that says the seven spirits are, they all come from the Holy Spirit, and it, you know, seven bold, like complete, would be better translation, or the seven spirits. Are not yeah. Spirit. No, that it's not an easy one, and, and good. Thank you for bringing that up because I didn't have that uh, on the radar screen there in four with the footnote to A from the seven spirits, the one who is coming from the seven spirits or the sevenfold spirit. So we probably aren't too hung up on, you know, again, it can be helpful to say, well, what is he not saying? Probably not talking about seven holy spirits, yeah. Father, Son, and Spirit. But when you go to, you know, I should know that, I'm sorry. Isaiah, uh, and is it 9, 11, where he talks about uh, in, in the Messianic age and the spirit coming in, and then he goes and lists the seven like attributes of the spirit. I, I wonder because it relies so heavily on that Old Testament imagery. I mean, nearly all of Revelation is, is steeped in, largely in Daniel and Ezekiel, but in other parts of the Old Testament as well that uh, I wonder if that could be part of it too, the seven attributes uh, that, that you see there. Uh, the, spirit, the spirit will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom, of power. And uh, so that, that may be it as well. Uh, yeah, good, good reflection. Keep, uh, then just look, uh, as you let off their revelation of Jesus, and it's easy for us to put it in the plural, but it is revelation singular, the revelation of Jesus. Yeah, Miguel. Yeah, on the verse three, when you say, uh, let the deceived who weep, and those who hear the word of this prophecy, uh -huh. and, and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. So I think, I mean, not only him, also the disciples and apostles thought that the time was already coming when Jesus was coming. Yeah. And uh, so you said the time is coming. So that was, that's something that catches my eye. Yeah. They probably thought it was already coming. Yeah. Yes, and, th and that's very true. Miguel just sharing there from verse 3. Those are the one who reads the words of this prophet, and the ones who hear it, uh, because the time is near. And uh, so there is much of what happens in Revelation that is very near future for them. And, uh, and then, as you say, even during the first century church, there was an expectancy that the second return of Jesus, you know, was very close at hand. They might be surprised that 2,000 years later, he, he hasn't returned. And Peter deals with that in his, in his letter. Right. Some say, you know, uh, well, he's not coming. He's not coming back. And that was only, that was only at 60 AD, much less 2,000 years later. So there's still people who, who doubt. But of course, we get a picture of God's time frame there in Second right. Peter. You know, you know the, the, how different it is in his time frame and ours. Uh, a thousand years as a day, a day as a thousand years. God exists outside of the construct of time. Uh, because that, that same thought is there, Miguel, in verse one, gave him to show his servants, which must soon take place. So there, these were events and the different in, the, in your notes, especially in unit one, you'll you know, you'll see some of the mainly four different views or interpretation of Revelation. Uh, and some, you know, have, have none of it happening. It's really not historical, not happening at that time. Uh, but he is clear that these things that are happening, uh, that he's speaking about here, uh, will soon take place. And then as we go through it, I think as we as we look at the way that it played out in the Roman Empire, it will it will make sense to us, and I think it'll be, uh, you know, encouraging and strengthening to us. You get to, uh, well, don't overlook the thing in verse three. Blessed uh, is the one who reads, and the NIV, the later version of the NIV, NIV eighty four doesn't say aloud, 
the newer NIV inserted aloud, reads aloud. But it doesn't have to be just reading aloud. Uh, we know we're blessed by reading it, but yes, read it and read it aloud. Uh, words, not only of this prophecy, but all of the word of God. John to the seven churches, uh, Tim Mackey mentioned in the Bible Project video, seven's huge in the book. And so, yes, we're gonna see a, a lot of sevens here, the seven, seven churches, the seven spirits that you mentioned, Joseph, or sevenfold spirit. And verse five, Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, uh, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Not that kings of the earth, the rulers of the earth acknowledge that, right? Rome didn't acknowledge Jesus as ruler over them. Caesar certainly didn't. Uh, but in reality, of course, he does rule. And he's the faithful witness. Uh, Barb, you mentioned that, the firstborn from the dead, and he's the faithful witness. Um, Jesus is the true one. You know, what he says about, you know, truth there in John, John 8, uh, you will know the truth. The truth will set you free. Uh, when, whenever we think of faithful and truthful witness as opposed to, and the Holy Spirit most often in John is referred to as the spirit of truth because there's so much untruth in our world. Uh, Jesus was faithful, truthful. Uh, then he goes on in verse five, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, speaking of Jesus. Has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. Be glory and power forever. That kingdom of priests is significant. Uh, Peter, 1 Peter 2, 5, and 9 talks about that. David, did you have oh, something? Yeah, I'm just going to go back to verse 1. Um, yeah. When he said, he made it known by sending his angels to the servant John to testify to everything he saw. Did, did, did the angel... Uh, I mean, John had a right, had to write down a lot of stuff to see this. Was the angel there to help him? It's not like the God inspired the authors of these books to write. Was the angel there to help him to write all this down, perhaps? And yeah, a good question. David is asking there from verse 1, which the revelation of Jesus, God gave him to show his servants on this the place, made it known through sending his angel uh, uh, to his servant, John. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, how did the angel help in delivering it? Because uh, a lot of it, of course, the imagery is of Jesus himself. Uh, and so we don't, you know, we don't have uh, a complete inside track on that exactly. In what way did the angel help him with this revelation? There is a lot here. Some will talk about, you know, delivering, uh, uh, of course, what, what one sees in a vision or revelation like with Paul himself, he's, you know, in second Corinthians said, when I went up into third heaven, he said, was I there in body or in spirit? He said, I, you know, I, I don't know, but he had a clear remembrance of it. So John has shown a lot. We, we trust or assume that it was by the, the ongoing work of the spirit that helped him to, you know, break that down. The angel is part of the revelation. The spirit is there. Uh, so it, it, it could have been that the angel was helping in, you know, uh, getting it all written out, but maybe more likely after the revelation, uh, there was the spirit, like Jesus said of the spirit in John 16, 8 and 13, when the spirit comes, he will lead you into truth. When the spirit comes, he will remind you of what I have said. And so it's, it's very possible that, you know, that was an ongoing work of the spirit in uh, you know, putting it to, to paper like this. But yeah, good, good thought and reflection. You go on there into verse six, made us a kingdom of priests. Uh, significant in that, uh, again, mentioning that it's First Peter 2, 5 and 9 that talks about that, we're a kingdom of priests, that, that we all have a role and a function in this body of Christ, whereas Previously, one the priestly family of Aaron and the high priest, uh, you know, went through through one Jesus, the great high priest. Hebrews now makes us a kingdom of priests. So we 
we have privilege and responsibility to help be priests to one another, to minister to one another, to help bring one another before the throne of God. And it helps me at least in my day-to-day -day work sometimes to step back and, and take a kind of a, a 30,000 foot view uh, of what, what, what are we doing whenever we pray with somebody, whenever we encourage or counsel. You're doing the work of a priest. You're helping someone. You're helping bring someone before the Lord. Uh, Hebrews 4, the thought of the, at the throne of grace, finding strength and help in time of need. And you're, you're helping to do that. You're helping to mediate whenever you bring someone uh, before the Lord like that. So just, a, I hope, a helpful and encouraging reflection there. You go on to, to 7, uh, not a quote. Let me turn. Um. This one off, I don't need it. Uh, a lot of references to scripture. This one uh, would sound like maybe one of the prophets, but not just in verse seven, he's coming in the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, even though Zechariah does write about looking on the one whom they had pierced. So some of the imagery is taken from Old Testament still, even if they're not quoting and the peoples of the earth will mourn, so shall it be. I am the Alpha and the Omega, and similar to what Jesus repeats later there in, in verse 17, I'm the first and the last, who is, was, and who is to come, the Almighty. And one of the things I think that helps us there is, uh, you know, God is constant, never changing. And that can help us in reading scripture Whenever we get some of the difficult passages in the Old Testament or even the New Testament, God hasn't changed again, not schizophrenic, not doesn't have two personalities. And so uh, it that helps us to know God is constant. When we have the greater revelation by John that God is love, we we take that, we go to school on it, and we help use that lens to to read all of scripture. Uh, Thoughts from anyone there as you're up to verse eight? Otherwise, we'll keep going on into nine. The vision in that he has of Jesus as the son of man. So I, John, verse nine, your brother. And so this is really notable. You know, look at it here. Uh, I, John, your brother and companion in suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that our hours in Jesus was on the Isle of Patmos because of the word of God on and the testimony of Jesus. So, and just pause there. Just look at verse nine, read it again, reflect on it a second, what, what he is saying to us there. Just take a moment of silence and look at it. Kirk. Yes. I, come, I come up with um, the um, joining with Christ as brothers and sisters and the suffering uh, of all those that are in Christ. Yeah, certainly that, that is a, a big component of it because when, when you look at that, and I don't know if you'd ever noticed it before, I had ended up marking it. Uh, because even just in our previous class in James, we were talking about how we need a good theology of suffering, a good understanding of suffering, and, and we get a bit more of it right here. Your brother and companion in the suffering kingdom and patient endurance. He mentions kind of three components there, uh, the suffering, the kingdom of God, and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. And I'd say probably two of the three we like really well. You know, we, we'd be all for patient endurance, yes, even though we don't really want to pray for patience, right? Uh, but we, we like patient endurance. The kingdom of God, that's a good thing. Uh, but what about the suffering? Companion in the suffering, that is ours in Christ Jesus. So, of course, when we read scripture, uh, 
when we read it well, we, we know that, that suffering is part and parcel of our lives as disciples. You take Jesus' call to discipleship. There's nothing, there's nothing poor and strange here. Matthew 16, 24, when he made his call to discipleship, what does he say? If any man would come after me, let him do what? Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And Luke adds, uh, he adds one element there, take up your cross daily and follow me. So I believe it was Bonhoeffer that called Jesus' call to discipleship the least manipulative call or invitation ever offered. He's basically saying, if you want to follow me, I bid you come and die. And it's not usually how you get people to follow you to get big crowds. I bid you come and die. But that is in essence the call of Jesus to discipleship. And, and that's what John, he knows it. He has already seen it and experienced it in, in exile as he is. He has fallen out of favor if this is John. Uh, the apostle, the author of first and second, you know, first, second, third John, and the Gospel of John. Uh, tradition would tell us he lived in Ephesus, and it, there came a point there in Ephesus where if they did not offer the, you know, the 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 votive offerings and the sacrifices to Caesar to Rome that was required, then they began to be persecuted. So that may be the reason that, that John is here. So he understands suffering, and I just don't want that to quiz past any of us that we understand that suffering is ours in Christ. And the verse that we just covered in the previous class, I want to mention it here, though, for this class, Philippians 129, where Paul says, it has been granted to you not only to believe on Jesus, but also to suffer for him, that it's a privilege, that it has been granted to us. And so when we have a good theology of suffering, we understand that uh, Again, like using the analogy of railroad tracks, that joy and pain run parallel in our lives and the difficulties, the trials. And then so instead of, of kicking against them or you know, maybe getting impatient with God screaming, why, why are you letting this happen to me? That we understand the way that it deepens us and matures us. Any thought or reflection on just that there? Uh, if not, we'll certainly move on. Uh, we'll have to. Keep going to get on through it. I think that, you know, I've heard of a summer who didn't explain it was in the New Testament and he was all the you know, yeah. say that I got shown all the stuff. Right. I think it gets to um, much like a, a, a father who provides for a family and goes to work every day. Uh, he doesn't go to work because he's not there and going to work, but he's in the war is providing for his family. And I think when you it becomes, I think, the more you do it, we start to be see things like maybe Peter and Paul when they're in prison and they're singing praises to God even after they've been beaten and everything, where you start to find the joy in the suffering. Yeah. Because you've removed yourself out of it, or you know, that longer maybe even refer to it as suffering. Right. Uh, then I think you really start to grasp the, the joy that the, the peace that hope carries you. Right. No, very the foundation you start to yeah. Not upon our emotional ideas in the flesh, but upon our spiritual ideas. Yeah. No, it's, it is so true. Very, very good. Uh, that it won't be something arduous to us that we may not even begin to just see it as, as you know, the bane of our lives or something that we don't want to go through. Not that we, again, I said last time, not that we're just saying, oh, yeah, I like it. Bring it on. I want more. We, we never, we never do that, but to realize it's like the disciples when Peter and John were, were, were flogged there early in Acts, that's four and five. They went away rejoicing that they were counted worthy of suffering for the name of Jesus. And that, of course, happens with our brothers and sisters around the world today, many that suffer uh, physical persecution. Yes, there's scars, there's pain, uh, but there is a joy uh, from suffering for Jesus. And so... Not that we bring it on ourselves. We don't want to be stupid and go out and try to bring persecution on ourselves. No, uh, but if we are truly following Jesus, it will inevitably bring us in conflict with the empires in which we live. 
uh, keep going there. Uh, verse 10, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, I heard. And so you'll see this kind of a literary device or something used more than once in the gospel. I mean, in the, the book of Revelation. Uh, he hears one thing, and when he turns and sees, it's something different. So in verse 10, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, why well, I was grown, but you see, send it to the seven churches. And then he names the churches. So there's a seven again. Verse 12, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And that one doesn't seem so, uh, you know, big. We're going to see it again in chapter four. But he heard this voice and he turns and sees the lampstands. Uh, here's one thing, but what he sees is, is different. 13, and among the lampstands. So it's not that Jesus, the voice is absent. Where, where was Jesus? This is, this is the resurrected Jesus. So where was he? Verse 13, where, where did it have him placed? Among, among the lampstands, among the churches. So some of them are already going through, of those seven churches, some were already going through some difficulties. Others were having it pretty easy because they were in different parts of the empire. So their situations were a little bit different. But so here are some of them going through difficulties. And, and where is Jesus? Is he absent? Is he, a, is he an absentee father, absentee landlord? He's there among them. It's just like the idea in Psalm 23. If you, you know, as shepherd, you know, when you do not, not even Keller's, but uh, other uh, uh, study of the 23rd Psalm, that, you know, he leads me beside still waters. Uh, but then you get to, so usually when a shepherd is, you know, things are good, a shepherd is leading out front and the sheep are following. But even today, when a shepherd, when it gets more towards the evening time, the shepherd usually falls back into the middle of the flock and the flock gather around him. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of the death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, not necessarily out in front. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Uh, so Jesus moves among the flock. He's there with them in their suffering. Even from John, I am the good shepherd. You know, those that are out for money, they flee when times get hard. But Jesus, he never left this flock then or even when he's resurrected. So we need to keep that at, at heart because sometimes we can confuse the silence of God uh, for the absence of God, think that he is absent whenever we don't seem to hear anything or sense his nearness, but he's not. You know, the, the proverbial story where one set of him, only one set of footprints, where were you while I was carrying you? That, that I, he does not leave us, even the Great Commission. I am with you always. He's among us. So it's significant that he's there among the churches. And then it goes on to give more of a description. We'll have to skip over some of that just because of time down to 10 minutes. Uh, 15, his feet like bronze. In his right hand, 16, he held seven stars, seven lampstands, seven churches, seven stars. And out of his mouth, came a sharp double-edged sword, his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Well, I can't just run past the sword coming out of the mouth because we've all seen, we try to draw this, right? And we should, we should just say, well, really it's ridiculous to try to draw it or to depict it as a sword out of his mouth, uh, even though that's imagery, but remember, of course, it's figurative language. And so Jesus literally does not have a sword. It won't appear with a sword coming out of his mouth. Uh, what, what do we, if we, if we really try to delve just a little more deeply into it, what do we know about sword? Well, the word of God is living sharper than any double edged sword. The word Jesus from John 1, in the beginning was a word. Uh, you know, he's the, he's the word of God. In, in, in Mark 1 25, he dispatches a demonic spirit. How? With his mouth, with his words. And he dispatches it. So in that sense, you know, yes, slays evil, but not with a sword. Again, not bloodletting, but with his word of truth. Well, it's significant. So we maybe we can ditch the this, this odd, awkward picture of him 
literally with a sword coming out of his mouth. And it is his word. It is the word that it's the it's the word of truth. Uh, John A, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Uh, so that's a lot more inspiring, I think, and encouraging uh, when we think about his word uh, doing the work, of setting people free of dispatching evil. And 17, then when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead seems to be a, a common response to seeing and either spiritual beings, angelic beings, or any images of God, whether it's Isaiah and, and Isaiah 6, or here, this vision of Jesus. He placed his right hand on me and said, and what does he say? What's his first words to John? Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. And so you've probably heard it said, and uh, you know, that the most common command of scripture in scripture is not love one another. It is don't fear, don't be afraid. Some say there's some counting three used 365 times, one for every day of the year. Some will say no, 366, even that even covers leap year. You know, the fact the, the point is God understands that we deal with fear in our lives. And uh, he's not all put out with us when we struggle with fear. You see it throughout, even in the famous Isaiah 7, before the promise of 714, the virgin will give birth to the son, saying, be careful, do not be afraid. And his first words to John here, don't be afraid. Uh, we, we need to be comforted by that in the pandemic. We ever, you know, it doesn't mean that we don't need to be smart about, you know, handling ourselves in it, but we, we don't have to fear. We center ourselves in God. Psalm 46, 10, we still know that he is God. It calms us. It centers us. Uh, don't be afraid. Uh, I'm the first and the last similar language to the Alpha and the Omega, the living one, I'm the first one from the dead, kind of echoes verse 5. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forever and ever. I hold the keys of death and Hades. And so Jesus is, you know, provides hope and assurance for us in that way, uh, even when we face death. Uh, it may, uh, most of us, I think, would say we're not afraid of dying. Uh, it may be the process of, you know, afraid, maybe the process of dying, the, the, of dying itself, that could be a little frightening to us. Death, you know, we're not afraid of death, of passing over to going and being with, with Christ, but says to us, don't, don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. And then finishing up in 19, uh, right, therefore, what you have seen, kind of back to your question, David, from verse one, write it down, what you have seen, what is found, what will take place. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstand is this, and then he spells it out. And it doesn't do this all throughout, but it's good to keep this in mind because it comes into play later. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches themselves. Uh, that gets us started in Revelation. Any, from any of you there online or here, uh, any questions, observations? We got a... Um, a couple of I mean, one is like if you're thinking of like jail, right? We get you out. It doesn't mean you won't go in, or you may not be there for a time. But mm -hmm. the only thing power to free you from death. Um, yeah. And I don't know if they're total stretch, but I guess I'll have to make them more than just uh, you know here to the keys, the kingdom. No. I don't know about the end here. I'm just saying, I'm saying that I'll think about it. So I'll look yeah, it up later. look it up later. <laughs> no, but that's good that Joseph just mentioning, uh, mentioning the uh, the significance of keys to death and Hades. And for sure, it doesn't mean that we won't go there because some of, some of these that he's writing to, some have already suffered death. Some will suffer death. We'll see that in chapter six, wait longer until the number of martyrs is, is filled up. 
And so, but it's that, and I appreciate you uh, emphasizing that the fact is he has control over it all ultimately. And even if we're not spared the death or even some of the physical persecution or suffering, he is with us through it and he carries us through. Well, uh, so good. Uh, hey, Kirk. Yeah. I'm sorry, can I ask a quick question? I'm yeah. noticing also the significance of uh, it always stating his right hand, like he laid his right hand on me. And then also it says, uh, this, when it talks about the stars, and you saw in my right hand, yeah. So I know there's significance in there, uh, but I'm not quite mm -hmm. sure what that is. Well, I, I probably won't do the best job here in just a short time of, of, you know, just giving a definitive answer on that. In short, part of it at least is that that's always a, a place of favor throughout, you know, even throughout scripture. You, you see it in the Psalms, you see it at, you know, at, even Jesus, when he's talked about being at where? At God's right hand. And uh, culturally, of course, in many cultures, it was that way in Kenya when we were there. Uh, you know, there's more honor attached to the right hand than the left hand because you do certain things with the right hand uh, and certain things with the left hand that you don't, you don't really connect the two. But in scripture, at least, Martin, it is always a place of honor, uh, you know, and, and power than as you look at some of the, the rulers of the earth. And uh, so I, at least some of the significance of the message is that, uh, you know, the lampstands, the churches, keeps them in a place of honor. Even though some of them have trouble, have problems, uh, he doesn't dishonor them for that. And the fact that he touched him. Of course, that's the Jesus of the Gospels because he was always touching and healing and making whole. He reversed kind of the curse that we see in the Old Testament under the law of Moses. If you touch the leper, it wasn't that the leper was made clean, you were made unclean. And Jesus reverses that. He touches the leper or he touches the dead body and he's not made unclean, rather he makes them clean. And he, he touches John, lifts him up, says don't be afraid. So there's even that compassionate Okay, that's that's good. Yeah, Joseph mentioning that uh, what verses in the Psalms that the right hand used to comfort, to lift up, to hold up. So, well, very good. Good start, I pray, for all of us. And uh, we will stop there and uh, we will carry on next week. All right, everyone there online, uh, I will say goodbye. I'm going to just got to stop the recording first.